I was speaking to a group of kids in Seattle, and most of these kids, like many of us, they were born on the wrong side of the opportunity divide. And they're oozing with grit and potential. And when you look in their eyes, they just have this twinkle in their eye. And they're part of this amazing organization that has a phenomenal purpose to help these kids that have this amazing potential break the cycle that they're in. And most of these kids have grown up underneath the poverty line. And I was there to share some stories with them, and I've had an opportunity to work with them for a few years. After I tell them stories, we open it up to Q&A. And that's my favorite part of my interaction with these kids. Because it's my opportunity to really connect with them. And so this one day, I'm sitting there speaking to them, and there's this kid sitting on the front row. And for some reason, he caught my eye. And he was hanging on every word that I shared, and every story that I told. And after we opened up the Q&A, he finally got the courage to raise his hand. And he stood up, and he was, you know, he was sharp. He had this athletic build. And he says, so based on everything that you've been through, how did you get past the color thing? And I knew that it was my opportunity to really connect with this kid. And so I looked at him, and he had his, he had his cornrows, and he was all dappered up. And I said, you know, you got that whole Marshawn Lynch persona thing going. I said, you mind if I call you Skittles? And all his friends started laughing. Apparently, they teased him about that. And he goes, sure. I said, are you fast? He goes, yeah. I said, I bet I could smoke you in a race. And his eyes got all big. And I knew what he was thinking. He's like, no way this old guy can be. <laughs> and so I said, come on up here. And I'm up on this big stage, and his eyes got all big, and I know he's thinking, oh, bleep, maybe he can be. <laughs> and so he comes on stage, and we walk over to this side, and the whole time I'm whispering in his ear, I'm going to smoke you with dress shoes. <laughs> and his friends are getting all riled up, and I invite the gal that introduced me to come up on stage, and she's on the other side. And when I have my kids race, I always say, on your mark, get set, got them. And that's when we start, start sprinting. And so I told her to do that, start us when she was ready. And me and Skittles are right here on the side. And he's like getting down in a track stance like he's going to steal second base. And I'm whispering in his ear. And she goes, on your mark, get set. And right before she said, got them, I put my hand out. And I looked at Skittles and I said, what were you thinking when you were on that line? Uh, and he said, I was going to beat you. I said, did you care about anything else but winning when you were on that line? He said, no. And then I asked him, did you care what color I was? And he smiled from ear to ear. And I knew at that moment that he knew that I understood exactly what his question was. You see, he didn't care about color. What he cared about was, what do I have to do to take control of my own story? Great story. And so he goes back and he sits down, and from the time that he gets off stage to walk down onto back to the seat, like I could just see his confidence coming to the surface. And it made my heart sing because I knew that, maybe I didn't get every kid there that day, but I know I got skills. And he was just beaming. So like many of us, we just want to win. We're like Skittles. And we all started our company to figure out how do we get more. Whatever more is for us, that's what we did. But when you start your own company, all of a sudden, things get overwhelming pretty quick. And you take a step back and you're dodging arrows and you find yourself constantly getting met with distractions and there's no shortage of problems that come your way. And I know I often found myself taking a step back and asking, do I have what it takes? Can I win this race? I get how hard it is. You know, the first five years of 
uh, starting my company, I was near bankruptcy three times. And I'll never forget that sickening feeling that I had in my gut. And I eloquently call that first five years the most fun I never want to have again. <laughs> but after fighting through that and being resilient and getting my community to a place that I only imagine, and guiding many leaders like you to do what I call participate in your own rescue, I've learned that if you are going to take control of your own story, you have to have exceptional clarity around a few big questions. And it's not the only thing you can do and you have to do. But if you're going to take control of your own story, like Skittles realized that morning, you have to have exceptional clar clarity to what I think are the three most important questions. And so I'm going to tell you some stories like I did with, with that group that was with Skittles that day. And at the end of those stories, I'm going to give you the question so that you can understand the essence of what I'm, what I'm talking about. <clears throat> when I was 17, my, uh, my brother and I, we were on a trip home from a basketball day. And we were excited, and on the way home, you know, we had won, we were celebrating, and on the way home, the team stopped for dinner. And the team unloaded to get off the bus, except for me and my brother. You see, we didn't have the means to join the rest of the team for dinner. It's just the way life was for us. I'm the third youngest of 13. I didn't speak English until I was seven. I was the first one born in the United States. And so I still leave with my elbows on the table. I learned how to fight at a very young age. And we were well beyond the embarrassment. It's just the way life was for us. If we wanted to participate and play sports, that's how it had to be. And so my mom would make us our dinner. These Amazing burrito, pet kill for some day. And we were about to dig in when this gentleman comes on the bus. And he comes over and he rats me a little bit because my younger brother had outscored me that night. Very rare case, by the way. <laughs> and he then said something to me that I'll never forget. He said, Bobby, it would make me very happy if you would allow me to buy you and your brother dinner so that you can join the rest of the team. Nobody else has to know. All you have to do in the future to thank me is do the same thing for another great kid just like you on this bus. And it had such a profound impact on me that that moment stuck in my life forever. So despite the gifts of struggle that I've been given, and I was given the gift of modesty very early in my life, when I stepped off that bus, and reflect on that gift that Mr. T gave me, I knew that there was nothing that would ever stop me from creating some kind of vehicle to pay that gift forward to other kids that were just like me on that bus. And so in order to take control of your story, question number one, you have to understand who you're becoming. And nothing fuels who you're becoming more than that invisible force that drives you. So I'll ask you, what's the invisible force that drives you? But it didn't stop there. Because it's not just important that you have clarity on that. It's massively important that the community that you're building has clarity on that. And I made that mistake. For the first seven, eight years of building my company, I knew they could feel it, I knew they could sense it, but I didn't tell them that story. I didn't tell that story because I was afraid to be vulnerable. I didn't have the courage to open up to them. And I, I know they could feel the passion. I know they could feel the fire. But I didn't tell them that story. And finally, I participated in my own rescue. And I told them that story. And something magical happened. I connected with them in a way that I never had before. And even better, they connected with each other better than they ever had before. And magical things started happening. Because I learned when I finally shared that, that every one of those great people that were sacrificing so much to help me, they all want one thing that they don't always know how to get. And you can help them get it. That one thing is purpose. Like, we all want our lives to matter. We all want to be connected to something bigger than ourselves. We all want a lot of people at our funeral. 
We don't want to die, but we want a lot of people there. And they're no different than you and I. Who are you becoming, driven by that invisible force that drives you, will guide you to bridge that gap, gap between the life you lead and the life you imagine? Question number one, who are you becoming? <clears throat> this next story is about a <clears throat> man that I met in 1996 that forever changed my life. I was on the East Coast last week. His name's Dr. Joe, and I had dinner with Dr. Joe. He's a, he's a gray-haired, gritty, Sicilian type. Hits you between the eyes with what I need, not what I want. And he's always told me the kind truth. And so when I met Dr. Joe in 1996, I was working for a company. I was in my mid-20s. I was getting started, like Skittles, I wanted to win. And when I started with this company, there was a little bit less than 250 employees. So I had some good return on luck. I was right place, right time. And I'm moving all over the country for this company. And um, you blink and you fast forward a few years and we have thousands of employees. And I'm a kid. I mean, according to my wife, I couldn't spell my name until I was 30. Um, I say 29, she says 30. And so I had been promoted. <laughs> And I was in a leadership position. And when I look back, though, we were just a bunch of kids, man, as kids. And so they bring in Dr. Joe, who's a very well-known industrial psychologist. He's had a massive impact on the world, and he has a story life. One of those people that you can sit with and listen to for hours. And every time you sit with him, you learn something new that just inspires you. And he also is exceptional at helping you better, better understand who you are and why you do what you do. And so step one with Dr. Joe, they had chosen a group of us high potential leaders to be part of this, uh, this, uh, this, this program to multiply leadership in that company with Dr. Joe. And up to that point in my life, I'm relying on my grit, my resilience, my work ethic. Like, you know, I'm Mach 2 with my hair on fire. And one of the first things that they had us do with Dr. Joe is they had us take one of those uh, bulletproof psychological uh, assessments, a 360 feedback. I had no idea what that was. I just knew I was going to have to take an eight-hour test, and I was going to do everything in my power to cheat. <laughs> they were going to figure this kid out. And so I took this test, and you know, those tests, they ask you questions, and you're like, why in the world are they asking me this question? And there's this question after question. And so I took the test, Dr. Joe got the results, and I fly out to the East Coast to sit with Dr. Joe and have my feedback session. And during that session, Dr. Joe starts rattling off, well, you're the kind of person that does this, that does this, you have a tendency to think like this, you do this, you do that. And I'm sitting here thinking, they stalked me for four months. <laughs> and I'm still trying to cheat. I'm in massive denial. And so Dr. Joe pretty much comes to the conclusion that, and, and, and tells me, you're not a finisher. Your discipline's horrific. You get bored easily. Like there's not enough riddling in the world to keep you focused. And so I was, he, 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 he and I realized and we talked through it, I was the kind of kid that after a moment of inspiration, I'd go to the bookstore. And I'd go over the self-help and the business section. I didn't study who anybody was. I had no idea what I was going to buy, but I'd go in and I'd browse the section. And I'd say, I'm going to get this one, this one, this one, this one. Catchy label, fun cover, catchy title. I was guessing. And so I'd leave the bookstore with five books. And then I'd go back all motivated and I'd start reading one. And if I was lucky, I'd get to chapter four. That was a good day. And then I'd put it to the side. And then I'd start the second catchy book. And if I was really lucky, I'd get to chapter two. And then I put them to the side, they all became expensive coasters. <laughs> and Dr. Joe pinned this about. Me. And I knew it was true. It tasted like vinegar, but I knew it was true. And so he gives me this book, and he says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to read from front to back. And I inside the next two weeks, and I want you to call me. And so call the action that I need. 
So I double dog there, I'll take it. And so I take the book and I read it front to back and I call him a week ahead of schedule. And he says, uh, and so he calls me back and then he says, uh, all right, tell me everything you learned. And we start talking about it. I have my book in front of me and my notes. Like, bring it, Dr. Joe. I, I, I got everything you can bring in. And so he sits there and he's asking me question after question and I'm nailing every single one. And I'm feeling really, pretty proud of myself. And then he asked me the question that forever changed my life. He said, okay, Bobby, here's what I want to know. Based on everything you learned, now I want you to start giving me examples of exactly how you changed your behavior based on everything you learned. How did you change as a leader based on what you learned? Start giving me examples. You know what he heard? Crickets. <laughs> like, I could, he ripped my face off with that question. I could literally feel the skin coming off my face. I didn't have an answer for him. And I knew he had me. And he knew he had me too. He said, here's what I want you to do. He said, I want you to go back and I want you to read this book again. And this time what I want you to do is I want you to highlight every section that resonates and write down right next to that section that you believe will make you better. Write down exactly how you're going to apply it. And so I did that. And then I called him back about a month later to talk through it. He said, oh, by the way, I want you to brush your teeth with your left hand for the next 30 days. I'm right handed <laughs> He said, you need to learn to think differently. Because how you see things is going to determine how you do things. And so to this day, that book he gave me sits on my Bible row, and I review it several times a year. And I randomly will brush my teeth with my left hand. And I no longer put holes in my cheeks when I do it. The second big question that I learned that you have to take, uh, have exceptional clarity around in order to take control of your story is, am I a student? And see, what I learned with Dr. Joe was that being a student has nothing to do with what you read, what you learn. It has everything to do, to do with how you apply what you learn. You see, what you read, that book was 1%. But the application of it was the 99%, and that's where the magic happens. So what's that mean for us as a leader? Let me put it in perspective for you. So imagine for a moment that you, unfortunately, had to have some form of complex surgery. And your doctor refers you to a couple of other doctors. And so you go, and you're going to go sit with these doctors, and you've got to pick, who am I going to trust to take care of me? So you go and you sit with doctor number one, and he has a degree from some accredited medical school. And through the course of that conversation, you realize that this doctor has maintained his license. But there's something in your belly. We all have that, I call it the Huzonga meter in our belly. There's something in your belly. Do you guys know what Huzonga is? It's Navajo for bullshit. <laughs> a friend of mine in the army top. It was fun to say, but people will get in trouble. <laughs> We all have that Huzonga meter in our belt. And your Huzonga meter just flapping in the red zone. And you find out through that conversation that this guy hasn't kept up with his development. He hasn't kept the soft chart. He's winging it. He's spinning. I'm seeing all these counterfeit behaviors. He's faking the funk, whatever you want to call it. And then you go and you sit with doctor number two. And she, too, went to an accredited medical school. She, too, has her license. But in that conversation, like, your Huzonga meter is taking a nap because you can feel that, they've been, that she's been very intentional about developing herself. You can tell that she's been very intentional about being a real student and applying what she's learned. I'll ask you, who would you trust to fix you? I'll bet there's not a person in this room that would pick you. Doctor number one. It's not that complicated when you look at it from that perspective. So why would we, as leaders of our communities, expect our people to get better if we're not the ones modeling what get better looks like? And if you don't understand the downstream impact of that and how that impacts your story, we need to confront reality. And you don't have to look any further than your children. How many, how many of us have kids? Have you ever had them mimic your tone? 
Wouldn't you agree that people do what people see? They'll say something and I'm like, oh my god, they copied that from my wife. Because uh, there's no way they got it from me. <laughs> Am I a student has a significant downstream impact on you taking control of your story. And if you're not the one leading the charge, they will never follow you. Who am I becoming? Am I a student? So this last story is my favorite story. And speaking of children, this one was taught to me by my middle boy, Griff. My wife's Norwegian. Today's our 15th anniversary, by the way. She forgot. I didn't. So here's your typical middle kid. He's scrappy. He's fearless. He's all boy. Cheap shots his brother anytime he gets an opportunity. And he's charismatic, loves to dance. And uh, he's also stubborn, hot tempered, strong willed, just like his Norwegian mother. Because he certainly doesn't get that from the Latino side. <laughs> So Griffith, uh, on our, we have this annual vacation that we take to Hawaii, and it's become a bit of a family tradition for us. And we love Hawaii for a lot of reasons, and one of the reasons that we really connect with it is it's very rich in tradition, and there's so many things about the Hawaiian culture that we love. And in the Hawaiian culture, they believe in the legend of the Menihuni. And the Menihuni, they believe that they were these master builders. And they have amazing stories about the Menihuni. At this one resort where we stay, there's this, they call it the Menihuni Bridge. And so you can imagine how much fun kids have on this bridge. It is like a water park on steroids. And so there was this one afternoon, and I'd sent my, my bride to go have a much deserved spa afternoon. And I have all three kids myself. And so I'm, you know, great for me that day is don't lose one. <laughs> And great number two for me is I just want to be able to get them someplace on the bridge to where I can sit down and enjoy a beer from top to bottom before it gets hot. Mm -hmm. And you know how hard that is with young kids, right? It's like changing a tire on a moving car. And so I get them to this part of the bridge, and they're having a blast, and they're going up and down those stairs. And when you get to the top of those stairs, right beyond this clearing over here, there's a slide. And you get in at the top and it shoots you all the way around and then way down the bottom. And it shoots you out to a massive splash there, there below. And kids love it. And so I'm sitting back, I settled in, got my first beer, life is good. And so they're sitting there having the time of their life and a little bit after I sat down, uh, this gentleman comes up. And he has his little boy with him that was about Griff's age at the time. And he was Japanese. And his little boy had arms like a branch, hair about past his ears, parted right down the middle. Cute looking kid, but he was timid. And his dad walks him up to the bottom of the stairs. And he was encouraging him to go up. And so the little kid wasn't going to have anything to do with it. And meanwhile, my kids are just wearing out a trail, breaking every rule on the bridge. And Griff is leading the charge. And so this kid is watching my kids. And he locked eyes for some reason with my middle boy, Griff. And so this one time when Griff comes out of the bottom of the slide, makes a massive splash, he hops off, and he's walking right by this little Japanese kid. And for some reason, he decided to stop, just a kid being a kid. And he looks over at this kid, and he says, come on. And that little Japanese kid looks at him, he's like, uh-oh. <laughs> and Griff's like, all right, you're lost, and he takes off. And that little kid's just watching him intently all the way up and down. And Griff comes down, and this time he stops at the bottom of the bridge, uh, the stairs again where that Japanese kid is. But this time, he doesn't say, come on. This time, he puts out his hand. And that little Japanese kid instinctively grabs it. And Griff just yanks him up the stairs. And when you get about halfway up those stairs, there's this massive stream of cold water that comes down that kids run through. And that little Japanese kid had never been up there. And so Griff drags him to the middle of that, that stream, and I literally heard, <laughs> and he's just dragging him all the way up to the top. And when he gets him up to the top, you can see it right through that, uh, that, that area there where they get in on the slide. And they're holding hands. It's a cute scene. And I'm sitting there enjoying it. I had just got beer number two. I'm super happy. And Griff is holding the kid's hands, and they get to the entrance of that slide. And he points, and he goes to that kid. And they don't understand each other. 
Like, you're speaking English, he's speaking Spanish, he's speaking Spanglish, he's trying everything. And he points. And this little kid goes, uh uh. <laughs> and so, for some reason, Griff, who still has his hands, steps in, feet first backwards, reaches up, grabs his hand, and that little Japanese kid instinctively grabs it, oof, yanks him through. Takes him all the way down to the bottom of that bridge. They make this massive splash at the bottom. They come up, kids all full, all wet, smiling like a joke. And they hop over the side of that bridge and they do it again. This time he knows this, the, the wall cold water's coming, but I still heard the second screech <gasps> when he went through there. And so they get up to the top again, and I'm sitting there watching. And this time, when they get to the top, Griff points. And the little kid, uh uh, he still wasn't sure. And this time, instead of Griff jumping in, for some reason, my man just grabs him from the back and shoves him in. <laughs> and he jumps on top of him and he rides him all the way down, breaking every rule on the bridge. I'm loving it. Right? Long live the pioneer. <laughs> and when they come out, Joe get over too. That kid's as happy as can be. And so they're wearing a trail up and down, up and down, up and down. And this is my favorite part of the story. This one time when they come down, instead of coming off this side to go back up, the little Japanese kid goes off the other side. And he just runs towards his dad. And he gives his dad the coolest father-son hug that you've ever seen. And then he had work to do, right? So then he takes off and he's going to go catch up with Griff. Because Griff wasn't going to wait for him. <laughs> and he just goes back to it. I'm sitting there observing the whole thing. And I look over at this Japanese man. And his eyes are full of water. He's really emotional. You can tell it was a really special moment for him. And I'm kicking back in my chair. And he looks over at me and he gives me a very respectful bow. And I'm feeling good. And I'm all Latino, so I'm like, hey, salud. <laughs> and I get up and I give my best clumsy bow. You see, question number three is about leadership. It's about am I giving more than I'm taking? Because leadership is one of those words that can quickly become a big topic. It can quickly get overcomplicated. It's one of those words that we have all this huzonga type of stigma around. But unless I'm missing something, isn't clarity around am I giving more than I'm taking? Isn't that all leadership is? So when you notice someone that wants to do something but isn't sure, isn't leadership all about encouraging them to follow you? Isn't leadership all about extending your hand and showing them the way? About taking them through something that may surprise them, but they'll, they'll benefit from it? About getting to a point, and when they're afraid to do it, going first and bringing them with you and showing them that it's safe? And when they don't think they're ready, and you know they're ready, giving them that push down the slide that they need, and here's the most important part of that question. Is we can never forget that they're doing it for someone else that they want to be proud of them. They want someone to hug them and be proud of them. Am I giving more than I'm taking? You get exceptional clarity around those three. Like skills, you will take control of your story. And like I said, it's not the only thing. It's interconnected to a lot of things. And the arrows aren't going to stop coming. The problems aren't going to stop surprising you. However, there's a mindset when you're getting clarity around these three that I see leaders make a fatal mistake around. And they can rescue themselves all they want with that clarity, but if they don't have this one specific mindset around encompassing all three of those together, and I'm going to try to put it together for you with a metaphor from, from my time in the military. How many other veterans do we have in the room? Give them a hand. Thank you for your service. When I was in the military, I was, you know, they give you this fancy acronym. As your job, an MOS. And I was a 13 Fox. All that meant is that I was an artillery dude. And I was the person that was right behind 
the infantry, the people on the front lines, like those people that are helping you on the front lines. And so being in artillery was fun because I had a radio and I could call in artillery fire. Basically, I got to blow stuff up. <laughs> and that's a lot of fun for a young man. And I knew exactly where the infantry was. I knew exactly the fight they were fighting. I knew exactly where they were going and I knew exactly what the mission was. And so when I was in the artillery, yes, I would have to go down there with them sometimes. But most of the time, I had to be in my spot, calling in fire, keeping them safe, clearing the path. And too often I see leaders fighting this fight, thinking that they're every job in their own military. You can have all the clarity you want with those three big questions. But if you try to be the infantry every day, here's the reality. You're going to get shot. You have to take a step back and keep them safe. I believe that every one of us here, with making a few tiny tweaks in our mindset, whether you have to brush your teeth with your left hand, whatever you have to do to take control of your own story, everything you do today is an investment. And when you do, you'll realize it's simple, not easy. It's not going to happen overnight. But be the stream. Ask the Grand Canyon if that works. The Colorado River never stopped flowing. And look how deep it cut that canyon. Will you take control of your story? I'll hail the underdog. Go get it. <laughs> Thank you.